spät ist es? Wir haben kurz nach 40. Ich will noch einfach drei Minuten warten. Es sind schon 40 und dann. Andi, euer Tech. Ja, aber es ist auch echt doof, was wir heute machen. Immer eine Zahl. Ja, wirklich. Also, es war ja, aber das war so eine. Nee, 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 nee. Wir müssen gleich. Ja. Die starten pünktlich. Wir gehen einfach in die Mitte einmal ja. und dann übergeben wir die zwei zu. Das war zwar nicht Wasser, aber gut. Okay, dann kann ich machen. So. Hallo? Ich mal bitte eure Aufmerksamkeit. Jetzt vor der Keynote möchten wir noch unsere Gewinnspiele machen. Äh, zum einen die Bücher und dann zum anderen ähm, die Drohne und Fritzbox. die Fritzbox. Und wir hoffen natürlich, dass ihr alle extrem viel Glück habt. Aber es kann wie immer können nicht so viele gewinnen, sondern fünf Preise. Ah, fünf Preise. Bei uns gibt es auch fünf Preise. Also. <lacht> uh. Dann möchten wir jetzt mit den Büchern beginnen. Wir werden einfach transparent, wie wir es in ähm, fünf Namen ziehen. Die werden wir dann einfach nennen und ihr könnt dann nach der Keynote einfach an Stand kommen oder in der nächsten Pause und einfach sagen, dass ihr die Gewinner seid. Wir haben ja dann die Karte und wir können euch, ihr könnt euch dann ein Buch aussuchen und das bekommt ihr dann einfach mit. Ja, also die erste Person ist oh, Yuri Saragazzi. Ich hoffe, das habe ich richtig ausgesprochen. Bist du im Raum? Applaus für diese Person. Juri, ah, dann kommen wir einfach später zu uns. Ich habe den Zettel hier. Die zweite Person, Wolf Michael Dieter. Applaus. Ah, super. Okay. Herbert Göckel. Applaus. Wo? Wie viel haben wir? Drei. Die vierte Person ist... Rüdiger Lees, ich hoffe, das ist korrekt. Rüdiger. Ah ja, da. Ah, ich habe gesagt, ich ziehe ich. Also. Und die letzte Person, Thomas Müller. Dann könnt ihr nachher zu mir kommen und ihr kriegt von mir ein Buch. Okay, dann haben wir noch ein paar andere Preise. Drei Minidrohnen, eine Fritzbox und ein Jahresabo und der EX. Und die Vanessa zieht mal die glücklichen Gewinner. Wir fangen mit den Minidrohnen an. Der erste Gewinner ist, ist, ist die Christina Bornträger. Christina, bist du da? Okay. Oh, oh ja, genau. Dankeschön. So, der zweite Gewinner ist der Christoph Petzold, auch eine Drohne. Herzlichen Glückwunsch. Und die dritte Drohne geht an Juri Sagazzi. Zweifach gewonnen, Mensch. Herzlichen Glückwunsch. Jetzt ziehen wir den Gewinner des ix jahres -Abos. Das ist der Daniel Ebner. Daniel Ebner, bist du da? Herzlichen Glückwunsch. Bitte einfach mal zu mir kommen. Und jetzt noch... Eine ganz neue, frische Fritzbox, die geht an Daniel Langhans. Herzlichen Glückwunsch auch hier von unserer Stelle. Since our 
Today's keynote will be in English. We're just doing the interaction also in English. Welcome after lunch break. I hope everybody is okay and feel good. When we design the program for the NTJS, we always think about the state of the art. We try to get talks on what JavaScript does today, but we always want to have a look into the future. We want to see where JavaScript and its technolo surrounding technologies go. So it's only normal that we wanted to have a keynote on the future of JavaScript, ECMAScript. And we are very, very happy to have one person with us who can tell us very good, very well, how this future might look like in the next few years, because he himself is part of the team who is designing JavaScript. From uh, the Technical Committee 39 and from Microsoft, our today's guest is Brian Turlson. He's Senior Program Manager within Microsoft, and he will tell us about the efforts within the Technical Committee, what JavaScript will become, and what you can do as well to join the effort. So give a very warm welcome to Brian. Well, hello, everyone. Hopefully, no one is too sleepy after lunch. Um, so just uh, full disclosure, I am a language nerd. I really enjoy uh, programming languages. I like to think about syntax. I like to think about uh, uh, you know, just the sort of nuts and bolts of, of programming and, and how it works. And uh, so I hope uh, with this talk to inspire you guys to um, you know, go forth and, and help us build the best uh, ECMAScript that, that we can. Um, so in order to do that, I need to describe uh, a little bit uh, what TC39 is. I'm curious how many people have heard of TC39 before? So like less, less than half. Um, so that's the group that actually uh, designs JavaScript. So we'll start there, uh, and then I'll talk about um, various uh, language features that are in the standardization pipeline and how you can um, actually influence the design. So TC39, I asked people if they know what TC39 is, and the, it can't even be parsed. Like, what is it? Well, the technical definition is, it's the 39th Technical Committee within ECMA. But that kind of tells you nothing. Um, so a better definition is to say that TC39 is just people. It's a bunch of people from uh, member organizations. Um, certainly, all of the big browsers that, that uh, you're aware of have uh, representation in uh, TC39. Um, companies that have a really uh, vested interest in where the web platform goes are also involved. Um, so that's you know companies like uh, Intel and, and Netflix and, and that uh, sort of thing. Um, there's there's academics. Uh, there's uh, community projects. Um, you know JS Foundation and the Meteor Development Group and other individuals that are experts in uh, things that we're working on. Um, so it's, it's essentially just a, a group of people that every two months get together in a room, uh, but actually most of the work uh, is uh, on GitHub, which I'll get to later. So the 3,048 meter view of TC39's work is um, these three things mostly. Uh, there's ECMA 262, that's ECMAScript, that's the JavaScript language. Uh, there's 402, which is that internationalization API, um, the Intel object in JavaScript. That's a separate uh, specification. And also ECMA 404, spec not found. That is the JSON data interchange format. So uh, I'm going to talk just a little bit about history here so you can understand how this sausage used to be made and, and how uh, the sausage is made today. Uh, hopefully, you'll come away um, encouraged with the, the direction that we're going. So JavaScript was actually uh, conceived of in a 10-day time, uh, time period in uh, 95. Um, and actually, most of the warts that we struggle with as JavaScript developers come from this time where it was like, you know, Brendan Eich had 10 days to deliver a language to, to management, and, uh, you know, you can only do so much. 
Uh, it was originally called Mocha, and in 97, it uh, eventually was uh, standardized as ECMAScript. And we had this real nice um, sort of agile process, I guess. Uh, I say we, but I, I was not involved at this point. Um, uh, and we got edition three in uh, 1999, so I think probably many of us in this room cut our teeth uh, writing ES3-style JavaScript. Um, browsers during this time were like IE6, for example, was um, a reasonably compliant uh, ES3 uh, implementation. Um, so after 99, we entered this period where nothing happened. Um, if you're wondering where uh, ES4 went, it died in this, this span. Um, a lot of things were considered. Um, it, it, uh, the, actually, the, the language at one point looked very similar to ActionScript, which is the, the Flash version of, of JavaScript. Uh, and uh, like, there were even static types in there. There was all kinds of awesome stuff. But for uh, very interesting reasons that I think will make a great book one day, uh, it didn't work out. And so in uh, December of 2009, a decade after ES3 was released, there was ES5, and it added these four things. It added strict mode, it added getters and setters, JSON, and some object reflection stuff. So a pretty small release. And then it took six more years to get ES2015, or ES6. This was the biggest update to ECMAScript ever. It was huge. It uh, will actually probably be the biggest update that will ever happen uh, to JavaScript. Uh, and that's because, in a, in a large part, this is the culmination of a decade and a half of work within TC39. Uh, a lot of the stuff from ES4 that didn't work was actually sort of revamped and pulled into uh, ES2015. Um, so this had uh, promises, classes and modules, iterators and generators, uh, four of loop, typed arrays, and a bunch of other collections, arrow functions, one of my favorites, uh, destructuring, also a, a favorite of mine, proxies you heard about earlier, um, and just, just tons of new um, uh, library methods. Um, so after this, uh, we actually got a new process. After ES2015 released, we moved to what we're calling in the committee a train model, where we committed ourselves to releasing a new version of ECMAScript every single year, and proposals kind of work through um, this uh, process, and anything that gets mature enough uh, to be included in the language gets on the next train and gets out in the next version. And um, the, the key enabling technology there was also the move to GitHub, uh, the specification used to be in a Word document. It was actually the same Word document carried forward from uh, the late 90s all the way to uh, you know, 2015. Um, and like, it, it was actually kind of a testament to, um, the, I guess, upgrading and, and not breaking stuff. But uh, it was bad. Uh, so GitHub, um, we moved the, the spec to a plain text document. And so through this entire year, we got two things done. And they're two very tiny things. The exponentiation operator, syntax for math.pow, that's uh, star star, and array.prototype.includes. Uh, we wanted to call it contains, but contains broke the web. Uh, so it had to be called includes. Um, and so another year later, we got ES 2017. Um, well, actually, we don't have it uh, quite yet. It's going to be standardized, I think, next week. Um, but uh, this one is adding async functions, uh, shared memory and atomics. Finally, we can write multi-threaded programs in an efficient way in, in JavaScript. Uh, and object.values.entry. So again, a fairly small um, set of features, but um, you know, that's what the train model is about. We don't want to stack up you know, mountains of features and then release one thing at once that it takes people you know, like five years to learn everything. So now what? Where do we go? What's next? I have a question for you. What do you think? And do you want to help? You can. So participating in ECMAScript, there's three ways. Actually, there's a number of ways, but I'll call out these three. Um, uh, the GitHub uh, organization, the github.com slash tc39, 
Uh, there you will find links to the vast majority of the work that TC39 is doing. There's like 100 repositories there, uh, and I'm going to, throughout the rest of this talk, I'm going to be giving you pointers to those uh, repositories um, so you can dive in and get involved in the design or give feedback and that kind of stuff. Uh, there's an old school mailing list. Uh, it's uh, got a nice web interface called esdiscuss.org if you just want to read. Um, and there's also TC39 on Freenode. A bunch of TC39 delegates are there, so if you have questions about how to get involved or um, other technical questions, that's a great place to uh, get uh, support. Since we're talking about community, a code of conduct is, is very important. Um, it's a work in progress. Uh, so if you want, if, if you're uh, passionate about this kind of stuff, would very much appreciate feedback on the code of conduct. Um, uh, it's... it's um, Actually, it turns out difficult to uh, make policy changes in a standards development organization like ECMA. Um, so I expect it'll be a couple more months of, of working through the technicalities and even legalities of applying this um, code of conduct. But um, uh, certainly, we are committed to having an inclusive and safe environment for everyone to uh, participate. So this is how I actually got started with ECMAScript, and that was with Test 262. Test 262 is the official test suite for ECMAScript. In fact, you cannot get a feature into the spec anymore without writing a lot of tests for it. And uh, it validates how well an implementation uh, conforms to the ECMAScript standard, and it's used by all of the JavaScript engines uh, in existence, as far as I'm aware. Um, so Test 262, like if you find a bug, uh, you can write a Test 262 test for it, and that's probably a pretty good way to you know, let people know that there's a bug and to encourage them to uh, fix it. Uh, writing tests is actually a good way to get acclimated with the spec, because um, if you want to write a test for something, you need to know what you're testing, so it, it uh, helps um, uh, it grow your, your sort of spec uh, reading uh, skills. Um, and you know you might end up like me eventually a few years later um, actually working on the spec itself. Um, so for those of you who are interested in internationalization, um, I'm not going to talk too much about that because I'm mostly focused on the ECMAScript stuff. Like as I said, I'm a language nerd, um, but I'm also a Unicode nerd and actually kind of an internationalization nerd. So I did want to call this out. Um, but the uh, there's a bunch of stuff here um, and a bunch of new stuff coming, uh, so I definitely encourage you to go to this repository and check out the README, which has a list of the upcoming work that uh, the internationalization folks are working on. But here's the thing that I like the most, TC39 slash ECMA262. This is where I spend most of my days, actually. Um, in, in terms of how you can help here, filing specification bugs are great. Um, if you happen to find any. Um, but actually just like spec fixes and typos and clarifications, all of that stuff is, is very handy. Um, many of us on the committee have been doing this for so long that we've become somewhat complacent, I guess, with the state of things. So it helps to have people come in and say, this is, I, I have no idea what you're trying to say. This seems better. Um, also a bunch of pull requests are discussed there. Um, but do note that proposals don't use this repository. So if you have uh, a language feature that you want to see uh, in the language, it's probably best to discuss that on ES Discuss. If you're looking for where to talk about proposals that are coming up, that is this place. This has a list of all of the active, inactive, and withdrawn proposals that the committee is currently aware of. Um, so these proposals are at various stages of maturity, and I'll talk about those stages in a second. Um, but here you'll find um, uh, links to uh, proposals spec text and straw man, or, or straw man text that just means um, you know, a sketch of what, what, the, what the champions of the feature are thinking about. Uh, the issues in those repositories are used to work through um, you know, problems and design constraints and that kind of thing. And you also find FAQs and use cases and sample code and all of that stuff. So if you're really interested to know what the future of ECMAScript is, bookmark this repository, because this is where uh, you'll get those links to the stuff that we're working on. And um, you'll get a, a notification when that repository changes, which is usually a proposal is getting added or, or uh, withdrawn. So I mentioned that the, the TC39 has a, uh, st a stage process. 
Um, there's, it's a five-stage pipeline, of course, starting at zero, as is natural for all of us, I hope. Um, and uh, I won't go into details here other than to say as you move down the stages, it gets uh, more and more mature, ultimately arriving at stage four, which is the done stage, which is then triggers me to go and take that proposal and integrate it into the main document, and it'll get released in uh, the next version. So if you see anything stage four, that means the proposal is basically done. Uh, anything before that is uh, really open uh, for feedback. Um, one thing to note, I guess, for stage zero is that while you any, pretty much anything is valid, you do need a TC39 delegate um, to basically show up at committee and, and argue for um, your, your proposed feature. Um, so you can find, um, you can talk to those uh, sorts of people on ES Discuss or on IRC, Twitter, email, that kind of stuff. Um, so just keep that in mind. So what are we working on? What is coming next? Well, if you look at the proposals repo, there's a lot. There is a ton of stuff coming. Many of these are perhaps years away, uh, especially these uh, stage zero uh, proposals. Could be, could be quite a while before you see them. Um, but I wanted to talk about uh, a couple things that excite me a lot. Uh, so the first thing is classes. Uh, classes are undergoing uh, fairly significant additions uh, in the committee. There's three big things that are getting added to classes. Decorators, public fields, which uh, many of you are probably using already in um, things like TypeScript and Flow and, and Babel, and uh, also private field declarations, so you can add truly uh, private state to classes. Uh, decorators, um, have, I, I'm just curious, how many people in here have used decorators in another language? A lot of people, probably half. Uh, decorators has, been, has uh, been requested by a number of people that are, have used them in other languages like um, Python. And um, so this design is ultimately fairly similar. You can attach a decorator to a class, so that might do things like add methods or register it with a test framework, uh, something like that. Uh, there's also method decorators, which uh, you can use for toggling the enumerability or configurability or writability of a, of a field. Uh, or like at deprecates is pretty common, where it'll give you a nice deprecation warning if you try to use it. Um, there's, there's some kind of, um, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of things that you can do with uh, method decorators. And you can play with uh, some of this stuff uh, today in, in uh, TypeScript and Babel. So if you're interested to try these out, you can do it. Um, so all of these slides, I should say, have the link to the uh, GitHub repository, where if you're interested in how this thing works in detail or you want to offer your um, opinions or insights, um, that's where you go to do it. Uh, public fields, how many people are using public fields, uh, like doing React uh, development with Babel? Um, that's the, the, the name equals default syntax in the class body there, or TypeScript users. Yeah, not, not too many, a couple dozen maybe. Um, so this is really convenient syntax for making instance properties or static properties. Um, you can just assign them in the class body, and uh, it saves you from having to implement a constructor when all you need to do is initialize some fields. I put a constructor here just to initialize, or just to uh, illustrate that uh, name is actually, oh, that should be this.name, sorry. This.name. I'm fighting the urge to fix that right now, so I'll just move on quickly. <clears throat> Uh, uh, private, f uh, private fields uh, is another um, thing that I'm really excited about. We've heard from uh, library developers especially that JavaScript developers tend to not respect the public API boundaries. Um, so like an underscore property, they might think, yeah, that's, you know, that's probably private, but hey, I got to do this thing. So I'm going to use this underscore property. And um, now that the library is kind of in a tough place because they can't, um, they can't break. Uh, uh, they can't break those people, even though they've they've essentially violated their uh, API contract. Uh, so private fields give library authors a way to actually make truly private objects. 
Uh, and these are, so like if you're outside of the class, you have no way to see that there's a private field with it. You can't reflect on it. You can't uh, iterate over all of the private fields. They are truly, truly private. Uh, and the, the nice consequence of that is they never conflict with other fields. Each class, even if it's named, like even if it's X in all cases, each class has a different X, even though it has the same private uh, field name. Uh, the FAQ here is amazing. It's the most comprehensive FAQ. If you're looking at this wondering, why isn't there a private keyword? Why hashtag? That seems strange. Um, the FAQ has, has all of it, so it's like great reading. I, I really recommend doing it. Um, and this is also an example of where having co uh, community participation is great. We just got, uh, I think last week, um, someone proposed a extension uh, on top of this that brings private state to any object. And it turns out if we, it seems like a good idea, and it turns out if we want to support that in the future, we need to do some things now with, with this proposal. Um, so it's, it's really great to have uh, that kind of feedback, and, and just you know, uh, people like you uh, out there providing feedback can um, save us from going down a, a bad path. Um, so suffice it to say, perhaps there will be private in the, in the class body. Um, uh, it'll still be a private hashtag X, but um, yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to commit the biggest sin ever, which is to talk about regex in a keynote. <laughs> How many people are, consider themselves a regex expert? About yeah, maybe, a, maybe like a tenth of the audience. Um, I was always the person who, when someone needed a regex, they came to me and said, hey, I have a string. I need to find these things in it. Can you email me the regex to do it? Um, so I got really good at, at doing it. But um, in JavaScript, regexes are missing a lot of things that, that uh, you would find in other languages, like um, Python or, or C Sharp. Uh, or even you know, pretty much any other environment. Uh, JavaScript regexes really are uh, somewhat limited. So last year, I proposed what I called the regex buffet, a uh, bunch of possible features that uh, we could go and uh, tackle um, to, to bring JavaScript regexes into the future. And so uh, we'll talk about a few of these. And before I get into it, I should say that uh, V8 has done a phenomenal job implementing a bunch of these early proposals. So if you want to um, uh, try these out, um, that's, that's a good place to do it. Uh, one feature that is sorely lacking, this is the one that I hear from JavaScript developers the most, is look behinds. Uh, they're, they're a way to assert that your pattern is not um, preceded by some text. Uh, we have look aheads. We can make sure that, we're, that our pattern isn't followed by something, but we can't check that uh, we, weren't, we aren't preceded by something. So that's what uh, look behinds are about. Uh, where that really comes in handy is replacements. Uh, how, like, this, this comes up for me all the time. I need to replace something. I depend on contextual information, uh, but I only want to replace the part that I matched. Uh, so that's the last example here. Um, you can do just a simple replacement, whereas today you would have to use a replacer function and some string concatenation, and it's, it's really gross and, and hard to uh, get exactly right. So uh, I'm, I'm super excited about uh, look behinds. As I mentioned, I'm also a Unicode nerd, so this is, this is great. I also write uh, a bunch of uh, parsers. Um, so anyone who's, who's writing um, parsers of any sort, uh, this will be a, a very welcome feature. Uh, but Unicode defines a bunch of character classes, basically. They define like what a character is. Is it uppercase, lowercase, white space, an identifier? Does it belong to a script from a certain language? Is it a control character, a byte character, a piece of a grapheme, an emoji, an emoji combining character? There's like dozens of them. Uh, and in, in JavaScript developers today, if they want to match those things, they have to build a giant disgusting regex that references the hex code of each of those things. And so this just lets you use uh, the Unicode uh, standard rather directly in your regex. So in this example here, 
Um, these numbers are, um, Unicode says they're actual numbers, um, but they are not the typical ASCII code points. They're fancy numbers. I mean, they look pretty cool, I think. Uh, so if you wanted to match them, you, you'd be in for a bad time. But with the uh, backslash p syntax, the, the Unicode property escapes, uh, it becomes actually trivial. Uh, another cool part about this is that recently we uh, pinned ECMAScript to the latest version of Unicode. So if you're concerned about matching all of the latest emojis and such, um, which presumably all of us are because emojis are cool, uh, you're, you're going to have a better time with the, with the latest Unicode standard. Um, another one that I really like because it, I don't see it as much, I mean, it is very handy to use, but it's actually also good because it makes your regexes more readable. Uh, name capture groups. Uh, it's just a normal capture group, but you can give it a name. And then you get an object with matches on it that you can just pull out, uh, and it works great with the structuring as well. Um, so you can, um, yeah, I'm, I'm eliding the, or I'm omitting the, um, the null check here for the match, but. Um, anyway, it's, it's really uh, a nice, handy uh, uh, feature. Um, there's, there's not, all of you that, not all of you are doing regex, but I'm curious. How many people have been bitten by the fact that dot in regexes doesn't match everything, notably line breaks? It's like a couple dozen of you. Like it, this bites every developer. Why it's this way, I actually don't know. Uh, it's, it's very strange. Um, and unfortunately, we can't just fix it because now there's the whole internet basically depends on the fact that regexes don't match line breaks. Uh, so the fix is add a new S flag, which says, hey, actually dot should match everything rather than most things, but like four different characters. Um, I've, I'm pretty sure I'm just going to develop muscle memory to add S onto every regex because why would you not? Why would you not want that? Uh, so there's pipeline operator as well. Functional chaining, I kind of think of this as syntax for Lodash. Uh, it's a way to pipeline your uh, arguments through a chain of, of transformations. Um, as part of this, I want to try and tackle syntax for uh, partial application of functions. Um, so that's, that's the last example there. Uh, maybe if you have a function call and there's a question mark in there, it returns you a, a, another function that takes that placeholder as a parameter and then calls a uh, map or what have you. Um, I'm really excited about this proposal. There's so many libraries in our ecosystem that uh, use this sort of functional pattern, and functional pipelining uh, is, a, is a really, really nice language feature for those libraries. Um, the inspiration for this is um, uh, F-sharp and, and a couple others as well. Um, so probably a lot of you are, are using languages, actually, that have uh, these features. There's a bunch of other stuff coming. Like you saw that proposals list. I, I couldn't talk about all of it now. I just talked about the ones that um, you know I thought were the most exciting. Uh, there's a few others, uh, realms and frozen realms and realm sna snapshots. I'm going to skip that for the the, the time being. But um, uh, that is a lot of interesting work uh, there and, and potential for uh, performance improvements. Um, there's a null propagation operator. Uh, this is a very common request from people. Uh, it saves you from having to do a null check before property access. Uh, so in, in this example, obj question dot x, uh, it won't throw if obj is null. You'll just get undefined. Uh, so it, it saves a lot of code, actually. Uh, JavaScript numbers are floating points. I actually began my career implementing a shopping cart system where, uh, current, or where uh, uh, currency was tracked in a, a float of dollars. Uh, I made a lot of accountant enemies there. Um, it's, it's bad. Floating points aren't, aren't good for everything. Um, but big integers are coming. Um, arbitrary sized integers, you can have an integer all the way from you know, uh, zero to uh, the number of atoms in the universe. It'll just grow and grow and grow until it takes up all your RAM. Uh, so uh, that's actually handy in, in a lot of cases. Uh, do expressions, especially for people who are comfortable with functional languages, I think are going to be uh, very welcome. Uh, it lets you, in an expression context, say do open curly, and inside there you can put statements. 
so you can declare like a temporary variable in there. Um, you, you, know, you can do more complex things. Um, but it's, uh, it's a pretty handy feature. And uh, one of the ones that I'm working on now with, uh, with uh, some of the uh, people from the Moment.js library is fixing dates. I have a question. How many people are happy with JavaScript dates? <laughs> yes, no hands. No hands. OK. How many people are frustrated with the state of date right now in JavaScript? Yeah, like everyone, <laughs> like all hands. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a tough situation, uh, and there's really not much that we can do to fix the problem in the committee because a lot of the stuff that we consider broken or hard to use or hard to understand are things that are also depended on by every website. So uh, the fix is we need a new date. Uh, so the temporal proposal, it's uh, TC39 slash um, proposal dash uh, temporal. Um, again, you can find it from the proposals repo. Um, we're, we're looking at a model kind of, we started with uh, the JDK 8 date API, um, also known as Jota time, uh, which is similar to Nota time in the C-sharp world. Um, that sort of served as the early inspiration, and we're moving on uh, from there. Um, I think many of us here are passionate about dates. That's very early stages. So, um, you know, if you're passionate about dates and you want to get involved, you can have a big impact uh, by participating in this uh, proposal. So, with that, I'll just remind you uh, TC39 works on GitHub. Uh, so, that's a great way for everyone in this room to get involved and uh, have an impact on the direction of the language. In some sense, where uh, the language is going depends on uh, what what uh, we hear from uh, people like you. Uh, the proposals list, watch it. Watch it. You can see all of the new stuff as it comes. Uh, ECMAScript, that's where I do work. Um, so I'll selfishly ask to you know, fix my bugs for me and that kind of stuff. Um, but anyway, I hope to see everyone out there. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Do I have time for questions? Yes, we do have time for questions. Excellent. And I suppose there are some. Yes, first question here. Um, my question is, I see a lot of people who use uh, Babel turn it on to like use stage zero stuff. And I was wondering, how do you handle that? Because what comes out in stage four from like the committee might differ from what they've implemented in the first place. How do you handle that thing? That's a great question. Um, we don't handle it well. Uh, so we, I, we actually, um, I, so I work on, on the TypeScript language at Microsoft, so we're, we're also a transpiler. And uh, our policy there is to not introduce any new syntax unless it's stage three or ideally stage four. And the reason is that uh, when you're in those early stages, it is actually impossible to not break them. Like, you know, we'll try our best, but we can't promise it. And so um, I think the, the takeaway message is uh, if you're using stage zero or stage one in Babel, um, you'll probably, probably be broken at some point. And I would, I would recommend being very careful uh, uh, doing that. I, w I wish I had a better answer. I don't know if, if people have better ideas. <laughs> I, I definitely want to hear it. Any other questions? All right. Time to find questions. Questions, anyone? Who's uh, like? We have one question there. Oh, OK. Right. I was going to start asking you questions, so. <laughs> Are there any specifications where you would like to go back in time and uh, fix them or <laughs> make them uh, yeah, unhappen? Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> so uh, the ECMAScript specification actually has an entire section devoted to that stuff. It's called Annex B. And it contains things like string.prototype.blink. Did you know this existed? Every string in JavaScript, you can call dot .blink on it, and it will return you a string with blink tags around it. 
there's a lot of stuff like that that is just legacy stuff that's been around for, for ages that uh, we can't get rid of because the internet has billions and billions of lines of code uh, of JavaScript. And essentially, anything that is syntactically valid has been written before and is depended on by uh, people. Um, so uh, check out Annex B for a list of stuff. Um, I think there, there's a lot of other regrets. I think we probably regret the with statement and um, uh, probably would have reserved more keywords that were relevant to where we are now because um, we are suffering from a lack of, uh, we have to do some sort of gymnastics. Um, like think about let, the let keyword. You can also have an identifier called let, right? You can say var let equals one. Uh, but it's also a declaration for a keyword. So uh, that's actually very difficult for us to handle and difficult to implement in a lot of cases. Um, so I definitely would like to go back in time and suggest, hey, maybe you should reserve let and await and uh, async, maybe a few others. I could pr probably take up the rest of our time talking about those ones. <laughs> Is there a chance that we get a use stricter or something like that, having another mode to get rid of this stuff? <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I mean there is. I mean there's a chance, you know, for everything. Um, use strict. I, I think we're not going to in introduce another um, directive prologue. That thing is called. Um, I, I would be very surprised if we did that. However, modules are kind of like a new mode, because modules are implicitly strict, and a weight is reserved at top level in a module, because by the time we were working on modules, we knew we wanted to have a weight be uh, a reserved word. Um, so there might be more stuff like that, but the difficulty is when you start adding these toggles and modes, it becomes very difficult to understand uh, what the behavior of code is, especially for uh, those of us who use Stack Overflow extensively and copy and paste code. like you don't know what mode that code is supposed to be running in. And, and that, that, that kind of problem uh, grows sort of exponentially with the more modes that you add. Uh, so we're trying not to do that. Um, but maybe some graceful deprecations are in the future. It's hard to say. Uh, it really depends on, in a big way, what is present on the internet. Uh, you know, as, as old sites maybe fade away, we have more freedom to, to do stuff. OK, maybe a follow-up question over here. Yeah. Ah, hi. <laughs> as a follow-up question for the one before that, um, like going back in time, are there any plans to add something like deprecated so that functional functionality which now, ex uh, now exists will be deprecated in, in a new release? Um. So you're, you're asking features that come from the past that I would be sad to miss, like from ES3. Yes. That's a hard question. I think, I mean, that, that is most of JavaScript, I think. Um, uh, certain things that people consider odd about JavaScript I really like, like the fact that it's a prototypical language. It uses prototypes under the covers. Um, I, I like that, that model. Um, I also like classes, for the record. Um, let's see, what, what would I be sad to miss? Like, I'm thinking of the stuff that we'd want to go back on that might be with, it might be eval. I think I don't have much need of those. I don't know, I have to think about it more. I, I do love most of JavaScript, though, so I, I, think, it, I think most of JavaScript uh, falls under that category. Got one up front. Yeah. Uh, um, what do you do to keep JavaScript simple? I mean, on the one hand, you add a lot of features mm -hmm. that makes writing code simpler. But on the other hand, we've got a lot of new features. And uh, I've got the impression that the JavaScript I'm writing today will be very different from the JavaScript I'm writing in five years. And every senior JavaScript engineer will probably not really be a senior JavaScript engineer because <laughs> the jun junior engineers knew, know all the new features. So uh, it's also getting more complicated. Uh, that's absolutely true. We, we talk a lot about um, complexity budget in the committee. Basically, how, how complex can we make the language? Is there room for things, uh, for new things? Um, we, we think a lot about 
how easy a feature is to learn. We care a lot about, for example, are you able to apply your existing mental model, your existing intuition as a JavaScript developer to help you understand this new feature? Um, like classes, for example, you can still look at classes as just syntactic sugar for the most part for the normal functional uh, class constructor. So if you're you know, an ES5 expert and you don't know classes and you look at classes, you can understand it in terms of what you already know. Um, I think it's just something that we have to be careful about. We can't add things willy-nilly. Um, you know, we have to be very intentional. We have to be careful and make sure that we talk to as many people as possible to figure out, you know, is this something that you understand by looking at it? How easy is this to learn? Uh, are there any surprises or gotchas or foot guns? Um, uh, it's a difficult balance because on the one hand, you want to make JavaScript uh, as great of a language as you can for uh, a variety of developers. I think one of JavaScript's strengths, for example, is that it's a really great object-oriented programming language, and it's also a really great functional language. And it turns out that those two camps kind of want different things a lot of the time. Um, and I think we can solve uh, both of uh, their constraints and more, but it just has to be done uh, very carefully. And this is an area where your feedback is especially appreciated uh, as you're looking at these features and you try to understand them. Um, you know, let us know how that went. Um, I think uh, I've written something about shared memory uh, on the upcoming ECMA specification. Uh, yeah. And I thought, okay, why shared memory? Is it not basically a concept from the past, and let's use channels like modern languages. Why have you chosen shared memory? So shared memory um, is the primitive uh, capability upon which higher level APIs like channels uh, can uh, sit on top of to provide um, uh, a, a more user-friendly way to uh, do multi-threaded applications. Um, it turns out that just sort of fundamentally, if you can't share a buffer of memory between multiple threads or in the browser web workers, um, you can't do much. So our, rather than make something super uh, friendly to use, our first tech was to put the primitive in the language and um, uh, basically enable library developers to build those abstractions on top of it that might be inspired by other languages or might fit with the, uh, the web platform uh, as it is. Um, so that, that, was kind of the, that was kind of the rationale there. If you look at the atomics object, um, it's actually really difficult to use shared memory. It's kind of a domain-specific thing. You have to know a lot about how memory works and kind of lower-level nuts and bolts that, as JavaScript developers, we typically don't worry about. Um, so it's, it's kind of an advanced feature, and I'm really expecting that there will be some awesome libraries that make uh, doing uh, multi-threaded applications substantially easier than they are with just vanilla uh, ECMAScript 2017. Hi, Brian. Uh, oh, that's loud. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, one thing, since you're anyways working on TypeScript as well, um, TypeScript is doing a great job of, like, getting features from, from JavaScript uh, or like from the future JavaScript standard nicely. But are there any plans to kind of re resurrect the plans of adding types to JavaScript from the ECMAScript 4 standard uh, and kind of like get the learnings from TypeScript and bring that to JavaScript? Yes. Um, so that is uh, a frequently um, asked question, certainly. Um, and is actually one that we've devoted a significant amount of effort to investigating and, and figuring out. Um, so I could talk for a long time on that topic, so let me try to be brief. The, um, so I, I, I have actually proposed types in uh, TZ39. Um, this was a couple years back. And the feedback that I got, which I ultimately agreed with, was it's just too soon. We need to wait for the TypeScripts of the world and the flows and the closure compilers to kind of uh, prove out the space more uh, and mature as tools in the ecosystem um, before the committee would start um, uh, diving into that. Um, the other uh, angle of it, which I think is, is pretty interesting, is it turns out that because TypeScript's type system is not a sound type system, it's 
um, a kind of academic term that just means uh, you have complete guarantees about what the types are in, in your program. Um, TypeScript doesn't have that. Um, that's because it sits on top of JavaScript and is not trying to be sound, but it's trying to be useful. And there's often a, a, a tension there. So we tend to go on the useful side rather than the, the, the pedantic sound side. Um, and without that, you actually don't get much benefit. Um, so uh, TypeScript's type system as it is would not significantly move the performance needle uh, for JavaScript on the web. Uh, now you can start thinking about, well, what would, it, what would it be like to put a sound type system on top of JavaScript? Uh, Google actually did an experiment uh, along these lines, and um, it was called uh, SoundScript. And uh, it um, was really cool, but it had a lot of difficulties. I think a lot of the gains were not quite what you'd expect. And it turns out if you have to interoperate with libraries that are untyped, you lose a lot of that gain because you need to do a marshalling process between the typed and untyped islands. Um, on the Chakra team, we did it, recently did an experiment where uh, we found we could get you know, meager speed ups. I think it was on the, on the order of 10% if you blindly trust the types in the program and you don't ever talk to untyped code, um, which in reality wouldn't be the case. Um, so the benefits are, um, I think, hard to, hard to find, especially when uh, you need to support all of the uh, existing uh, ecosystem. Um, which is not to say we're not pursuing it. It's something that we're still continuing to think about. Uh, it's just a hard problem, and I wouldn't expect it to um, come to fruition in the next few years even. OK, cool. Thanks. So I think we do have time for one more question. Yes. The winner is there. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do you have an update on observables? So I'm, I think it's great to have promises in the standard. Um, I would also like to see observables to be there. Yeah, <laughs> I would too. I, I would too. Um, uh, so observables are, I think they're still stage one. Um, there's, uh, so I, it's actually a feature that I, I, I don't think I'm officially a champion of it, but it's one that I, that I push a lot and I talk to uh, at least teams at Microsoft about a lot. Uh, and we do use observables on various Microsoft um, uh, properties. So it's, it's something that I care about and I do want to see it in the language because to me it feels similar to promises in that it's kind of a primitive for um, a, a asynchronous uh, you know, push stream. Um, but there's valid concerns. Uh, one of them is uh, with, um, yes, uh, the next version of ECMAScript is going to have async iterators uh, to go with the async generator approach. And whereas observables are more like your source can push uh, at the consumer at whatever rate it wants. And if you can't handle it, then you, know, you need to implement buffering strategies and all of that stuff. Uh, async iterables are a, a push-pull model, uh, which is, um, more, I guess, general. Uh, so in that case, the, the consumer says, give me a value and gets a promise, and then the value comes, and then it can say, give me another value, and then the value comes. Uh, you can think of that like uh, the, the sort of core of an observable, where the observable just pumps that thing, pulls out each value and, and shoves it. Um, and if we have the async iterable, uh, people ask, why do we need observables? Um, I think the answer is that there are a lot of problems for which observables are a more natural fit, like events especially, and events are everywhere. Um, but it's, it's uh, you know, again, because of the, the complexity budget, uh, we don't want to add something that isn't going to be like really, really justified in terms of uh, use cases. So if you're passionate about observable, please go to the TC39 dash, uh, or TC39 slash proposal dash observables um, and uh, give us your thoughts because um, the more that we hear from, from the people in this room that they want to see observables in the language, um, you know, that, that will certainly uh, help matters. Okay, there might be one or, one or the other question left, but I think, Ryan, you will be here around for some more time this afternoon. Yep, I have to leave um, probably around five, but I'll be around. So yeah, definitely come talk to me. I love to talk about JavaScript or TypeScript or you know whatever else, yeah. politics. So if you want more insights, he'll be there.
And if you feel spontaneously motivated to volunteer to join the effort, he will be there. I think you'll appreciate any, anyone who wants to join the effort. Absolutely. Okay. Brian, thank you very much for the insights and for you being here with us. Thanks, everyone.